Well, very good. Children, who likes playing sports? Put your hand up if you like playing sports of any variation whatsoever, even computer game sports. That's right. Uh, <laughs> there are many scoffs in the room as I say that. That's right. Okay, you guys like sports? Good. I'm glad to hear it. When I was a kid, I used to love sports. I don't look like it anymore because I'm, I'm older and I've put on a few kilos. But I used to love sports lots, played lots of different sports. And one of my favorite times of the day at school... Uh, was lunchtime. Lunchtime's the best day eh? because then you're not doing schoolwork. Don't tell mum I said that. Um, so I would love lunchtime because we'd always play sports. Doesn't matter what time of year it was, we would be outside playing sports and we'd always play team games. So we'd play soccer, we'd play rugby, we'd play league and it was great fun. But of course you had to sort teams out, right? And so you'd have this big group of kids that wanted to play. How are we going to pick teams? And then someone would always go, well, let's pick captains. So we'd pick two captains, so two kids, you know, the cool kids. They'd become the captains, and they'd stand at the front, and then they'd pick teams. And so we'd have Steve standing over here and Bob standing over here. Oh, we'll call Sue. Okay, Susan. Susan and Steve. Susan's over here, and she's like, oh, I'll pick Jack. And Jack goes to her team. And then Steve over here, he's like, oh, I'll have Shelly. And then Shelly goes to his team. And slowly the teams build up. Now, if you're picking your sports team, are you picking the best people or the worst people? Best. Yeah, because you want to win, eh? So you pick the best people first. So you're like, man, that guy's like eight feet. He's definitely on my team. And that guy's actually not even a kid. Definitely on my team. And so you pick all the best people. It's a bit lame when you're like the last one left, right? There was always a couple of kids. I didn't feel bad for them at the time, but I feel bad for them now looking back. There was always a handful of kids who would get picked last, you know, because for some reason, they had two left feet. And so they'd always, not actually, so they would fall over or they couldn't catch stuff, so they'd drop the ball all the time. And they were just really bad at sports, but they loved playing, and so they'd always get picked last. No one ever wanted to pick them. It's really, really quite sad, eh? But that was just the way it happened every day, week in, week out. You know, we've been chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and chooses people for himself. Now, if you're choosing people to be in the kingdom of God, what sort of people are you going to choose? I'm not saying what sort of people does Jesus pick, but what sort of people would you pick? What do you reckon? A fear. What do you reckon? Yeah, that's right. You're going to pick smart people, right? You're going to pick clever people. You're going to pick the rich. You're going to pick the famous. You're going to be like, man, that guy over there, he's really clever. I want that one. But you know what's really weird? Jesus does the opposite. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus picks kind of the dumb people and the poor people and the ugly people. All of the people that the world thinks aren't very good, Jesus loves to pick them. And he does that because what he wants to show everybody is that he is wonderful, that he is amazing, that he is powerful, that he is rich. And we're going to be seeing a lady that no one would have ever picked and that by faith she came to Jesus because she got picked by Jesus. Even though, you know what? I never would have picked her. And you wouldn't have either. Her name's Rahab. She's a very bad woman. But Jesus picks her because that's our savior. And he picks you too. You know that? He delights to pick you and bring you to you himself. So let's pray and thank him for that and ask him to help us come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he doesn't just pick the important people, but he picks the lowly like us. Thank you for his glory that is displayed in this. And we pray, Lord, help us. Help us to come to Jesus while he may be found. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are turning through to God's word together this evening. We're going to be looking, as I said, at the life of Rahab. I'd like us to turn through to Joshua in preparation for that. Joshua chapter 2. We'll read Joshua Chapter 2, keep your fingers in it because we'll be returning to it pretty swiftly this evening. Joshua chapter 2. 
And this is God's holy word for us tonight. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of the flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came up out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please, swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. And give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our lives for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills. Or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may, be, you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into this land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away. And they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned, and the pursuers searched all the way along and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. And then we turn through to Hebrews 11. For those of you who are visitors, we've just been working our way through Hebrews 11. We find ourselves looking at verse 31, the final uh, individual Old Testament character that gets spoken of. It becomes more general after this. Hebrews 11, verse 31, which says the following. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us. And before we consider it, 
Let us seek the favor of God. Father in heaven, we long to behold your Son tonight. We long to see him and love him, to delight in him. And so we pray that this evening, as we hear your word preached, that we would hear the words of Christ resounding in our hearts, that he himself would speak to us and that we would see him by faith. Oh, Jesus, would you call to us tonight that we might hear sweet words, the words of our blessed Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1 Corinthians, we read the following words. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were, you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is lowly and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's a blessed thought, isn't it? Do you feel like a very special person in the world? Very powerful? Do you feel like a somebody in the world today? Or do you feel like a nobody? Now, can I tell you, Jesus Christ loves nobodies. He loves nobodies. He loves to choose nobodies. For the sake of his glory. And we're faced with a nobody tonight. We're faced really with someone worse than a nobody. We're faced with Rahab. I mean, how's Rahab get on the list? I mean, don't even get me started about Jephthah. We'll deal with him next. But who chooses Rahab, you're writing a list of faith and you pick a prostitute. Right? The, the Jewish scholars reckon she's 51 years old at this point, okay? So a 51-year-old prostitute who's a liar and she's in the list. Why Rahab? Now, the short answer is because Rahab manifests the grace of Christ and shows that even a prostitute by faith can be welcomed into the family of God. This is a precious faith. I know Hebrews 11 verse 31 has very few words, but oh, brothers and sisters, they are precious words. And Joshua 2 and 6, when you take them as we're going to take tonight, alongside Hebrews 11 verse 31, there are precious gems and treasures contained within for us to meditate on for the rest of our lives. And I want to tell, I want to tell Rahab's story through five parts, five, five things, five points. Firstly, Rahab heard. Rahab heard. They're all very simple things, but Rahab heard. Have a look at 
Joshua 2 verse 10. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. We have heard. I've heard, she says. Uh, who told her? Have you ever thought about that? It's not like there's any preachers in Jericho, right? It's not like Jonah being sent to Nineveh. And isn't it striking that out of all of the inhabitants of Jericho that are described as the disobedient, there's just one person that hears the exact same news that everybody else hears. And responds differently. I mean, what's, what's the difference between Rahab and the next person along in the wall? There's no difference, right? She's worse than them. But she's heard a message. She's heard the news of the coming of the people of God. More so. It's not just that she's heard of Israel. It's that she's heard of their God, right? She's heard that the Lord has dried up the Red Sea. She's heard that the Lord has brought them out of Egypt with a strong arm. She's heard that the Lord has defeated two kings and that he is bringing them to the promised land. She's heard all of this and it's impacted her, right? She's heard all of this and it's had an impact upon her heart. It's affected her. Whereas everyone else has been filled with, with reviling and hatred towards the people of God. Something different has happened in Rahab. Rahab heard. She heard the joyful noise, right? She heard that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. She heard that there is a God in Israel. She heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. She heard echoes of a covenantally faithful God who is merciful and kind. Who welcomes the, the lowly and the outcast. Who welcomes the sinner. And what did she do? She believed, right? Second point, Rahab heard and Rahab believed. She says in verse 11, As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens and above and on the earth. Beneath And have a look at verse 9. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. It's incredible, isn't it? How does she know that? She's probably never met an Israelite in her life. She certainly never read the Ten Commandments. She's certainly never seen the Torah. She's certainly never been to the tabernacle. She's never heard the word preached. Yet she believes because she heard. She heard of the Lord and she put her faith in the one that was coming. You might think to yourself, how? How? Well, she heard of Jesus. They say, oh, but Jesus isn't there yet. Oh, I know that. Did you notice the description here, how she says that the Lord is God of the heavens and the earth? I wonder if you can recall a man who once had a vision and he heard, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, maker of what? Heavens and earth. And when John reflects on this, who does John say that Isaiah saw? 
the glory of Jesus. You see what Rahab heard, though she would never be able to explain it. She heard the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. She heard her Savior calling for her. In the, new, in the very news that brought dismay for the people of Jericho, life was born in her heart. And it's striking. You can imagine their neighbors melting, she says, right? Not a good melting, melting in fear before the death that is coming upon them. It's like those in Revelation 7, beholding the wrath of the Lamb, Hills, mountains fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. And in the middle of them is Rahab. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Lo, he comes with clouds descending. She waits with bated breath, doesn't she? Because she's put her faith in Jesus Christ. She's heard the joyful noise of a saviour. And unlike those around her, her heart is melted. But it's melted like those on the day of Pentecost. Do you remember? They were cut to the heart. And 3,000 of them believed and were baptised. Oh, that's what's happening to Rahab. And that's what happens to all that Jesus calls to himself. When Jesus calls to his children, they can never say no. You see, this, this dear woman, her name was written in the book of life, right? In the Lamb's book of life from, from before eternity passed, her name had been written down. And so the Spirit came and gave birth to a new being. And so when she heard the news coming, she heard it. She heard an accent. She heard a lilt that she understood. It was her saviour. Was she deserving? No. Was she worthy? No. My dear, dear friends, do you feel unworthy? Jesus Christ calls you to himself tonight. Come, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Will you come? Will you come to Jesus? Will you put your faith in him and live? Have you? Oh, what a blessing it is to know Jesus. She has her heart melted. So, so Rahab hears. She's heard and, and Rahab's believed. And what does she do? Rahab welcomed, right? I know that doesn't seem like much. For some of you, hospitality is not a very big thing. But these two spies come wandering in one day. And, and what does she do? We're told in verse 1 to 7, she, she welcomes them in, right? Who lets the Israeli spies in? Well, Rahab does. She welcomes them in. She, I can only assume, washes their feet and gives them beds and feeds them, and nourishes them and cares for them. Why? Because they're her people. You see, like Moses, she has accepted the reproach of Christ for it's better than the riches. Of Jericho. Like Moses, she has decided that it's better to suffer with the people of God than to have all of the blessings of Jericho, the fleeting pleasures of sin. You see, she welcomes them because she loves her Lord already. You remember those words Jesus says, anyone who receives these receives me. Isn't that exactly what she was doing? She was receiving the spies, and in receiving the spies, she was receiving her Lord. 
I know she wouldn't have been able to express that, but that's exactly what she's doing by faith. She's laying hold of the people of God and she's covenanting herself to them. Do you see the way that she uses the covenantal name of the Lord over and over and over again? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. She doesn't use the generic God. She doesn't say, your God, your God. She says, your Lord, Yahweh, the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God, the one who says, I am abounding in steadfast love and mercy and grace and kindness. And she, what does she do? She asks them to make a covenant with her, doesn't she? Swear to me, swear to me that I can be one of your people, please. Don't leave me with these people. Let me be part of your people. I want to escape the wrath of Israel and the Lord. I want to be counted among the people of God. And what do these two gracious missionary spies do? Of course. Of course we'll welcome you. Of course we'll covenant you to ourselves. Oh, come, join the people of God. Do you imagine the shock it must have been for those two spies? I mean, you're sneaking around, trying not to get busted, and the random prostitute that takes you in is like, hey, hey, by the way, I love Yahweh too. Let me join you. Oh, but this is what our Lord does. And so she heard, she believed, she welcomed, but she also continued, didn't she? I mean, we don't know how much time went between the leaving of the spies and the returning of the army. Was it a month? Was it three? I don't know. And yet she was given a sign, wasn't she? She was given, to use another word we're familiar with, she was given a sacrament, wasn't she? The Lord covenanted himself with her. The Lord gave her promises. The Lord gave her a word through her, his spies. And they gave a scarlet thread. And they said, here is the sacrament of the covenant we've entered into. And what did she do? Did she throw it in the rubbish? Oh, I don't need a sacrament. No, oh, I don't need promises. I don't need a baptism. I don't need a sacrament. No. So I don't need the Lord's Supper. No, she took the thread and she hung it in her window. And can you imagine what she must have done every time she looked out of her window? Every time she looked out of her window, she would have remembered the promise of God. Isn't that how the sacraments work? Every time you pick up the bread and you pick up the wine, what do you tell yourself? Jesus died for me. And every time you think about your baptism and you recall it, what do you think? I've been washed clean of all of my sin. And so she laid hold of the sign that she was given and she put her faith and trust in the God who had provided it and she waited and she waited and she waited. Who knows how long? Eventually the king might find out, right? One day, a guard might walk through the door and carry me away for the housing of these spies. And yet, by faith, she continued on. Isn't that the point that the writer's making to the Hebrews? Don't give up. And he's making it to us, right? Don't give up. Lay hold of the promises that God's given you and walk by faith. Don't give up. For God is faithful, and he always keeps his word. But not only that, can you imagine what she must have said to her family? I mean, it's one thing for Rahab, right? Miraculous conversion. But what does she do? Well, she's promised anyone in her household, right? All that belong to her, her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters. So what does she do? Dad, come over for dinner. I've got something to tell you. 
I've met someone. And he is wonderful in my eyes. His name's Jesus. Do you remember those days when you first came to the Lord? Your heart throbbed with joy and delight in your Savior, and you wanted nothing more than an opportunity to tell someone. And so you went out and you saw your friends and you saw your family and you said, Oh, I found a friend. Oh, such a friend. He loved me ere I knew him. He drew me with the cords of love. And so Rahab must have done going to her family, going to those she loved, going to her household and saying, come, the army's coming, come in. Don't delay. The time is short. Come in. And that summons comes forth to us, doesn't it? Come in. Don't delay. Come in. And we send it forth to our loved ones. Come in. Don't delay. The time is short. The king is coming. The wrath of the Lord is coming. Come into my household. And who's saved along with her? Well, that brings us to our fifth point, doesn't it? Because yes, she heard and she believed and she welcomed and she continued, but she also received. She received the outcome of her faith, didn't she? Blessed woman, blessed prostitute. She receives the outcome of its faith. It's striking, isn't it? Have a look at Joshua 6. Hebrews just summarizes it as she didn't perish. In Joshua 6 at verse 22, Joshua tells them to go and bring the woman out. In verse 23, we read, The young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her... I mean, it's, just, it's stunning, isn't it? All her relatives... And put them outside the camp. But you've got to read on. Have a look at 25. Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Do you see it? Do you see the magnificence of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ? One prostitute, one filthy 50-year-old prostitute puts her faith in Jesus Christ and her entire family gets welcomed into the people of God. All of them. The slaves, the children, the siblings, the parents, all of the household are welcomed in because the grace of God works that way, my dear people. This is the joy of a covenantal God. He extends his love and his mercy far wider than just our own individual hearts. He blesses it to our children. He blesses it to our loved ones. He welcomes them in in the covenant. Oh, yes, they too must place their faith in Christ themselves. But oh, the covenantal blessings that he showers upon them. And so she goes down in history as a woman that believes and is saved. But see the rich, the rich reward. Matthew 1.5 tells us that she's the great, great grandmother of David. The prostitute. And the ancestor of Jesus Christ, right? Isn't it stunning? I mean, this is the magnificence of the love of our Savior. He would come to a prostitute in her sin, and he would make her his own in order to come forth from her womb, so to say. Because Jesus is pleased to be counted among the wretches of this world, isn't he? Our Savior is not shy 
to be counted among the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Isn't that true? Remember that, that interaction with the, the religious experts of the day of Jesus, and he says to them, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God, and you are not. So let me ask you, do you feel like a sinner today? Jesus welcomes you. Jesus calls you to be his own. By faith, Rahab found an eternal savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the day she died? She'd never seen him, right? Can you imagine the day she died and was promoted to glory? And I can't help but imagine as she entered into the pearly gates, if there's such a thing, as she entered into heaven, if she heard the voice of her Savior calling her and said, I know that voice. I've heard that voice. Can I tell you, if he can save a prostitute, a wretch of Jericho, can he not save you too? Christ is sufficient to save all that would call upon him. None shall be turned away. All we must do is lay hold of him by faith and be welcomed. Oh, may God grant you to come. May God grant you to hear his voice, not just today, but tomorrow and next week and next year and for all of eternity. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds to our believer's ear, right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. Oh, what a precious Savior he is. How delightful, how wonderful. And we ask, Lord, would you grant us eyes to see him, ears to hear him, and hearts to love him. Ah, Lord, it never gets old. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.